In this video, we'll be doing an introduction to the cardiovascular system. Now, when I say the cardiovascular system, what am I really talking about? It, it's basically the heart and the blood vessels. Sometimes we'll see the uh, term circulatory system, and this is a bit more uh, expanded. We're looking at the heart, the blood vessels, and the blood. So that's, that's the big difference between those ter two terms. Now, uh, also when we're talking about the, the heart, it's hard not to talk about the lungs because, of course, its major job is uh, one side of the heart is going to send blood to the lungs, and that's the right side of the heart, and the left side will receive blood from the lungs, oxygenated blood, and send it out to the rest of the body. And because of that, we have the pulmonary circuit, the right side of the heart, and, of course, that's about taking blood to the lungs for gas exchange and then blood returns back to the heart. And we have the systemic circuit, which is the left side, and that supplies oxygenated blood to all the tissues, and eventually it does return to the heart. We have cardiac return that occurs. The left side of the heart, oxygenated blood arrives from the lungs via the pulmonary veins, and uh, this may seem... Uh, uh, odd that um, when we start talking about veins and arteries when it comes to the heart, and we'll come back to that. So uh, blood is sent to all the organs in the body via the aorta. Now, the right side of the heart, uh, oxygen poor, it's not completely deoxygenated blood, but oxygen poor blood arrives via the superior and inferior vena cava. And these are uh, two big blood vessels that collect blood from different regions of the body, one higher up and one from lower down. And they send blood to the lungs via the pulmonary trunk. And we'll have a look at this anatomy as we go. So you can really almost consider uh, the, the heart to sort of be two, two different pumps in one is that we have the blood, the de lesser oxygenated, often they say deoxygenated, and it's easy to think that it's without oxygen, but it just has less oxygen, you know, uh, arrives on the right side of the heart, uh, up in the atria, uh, atrium, and then is moved down to the right uh, ventricle, and from there it moves its way to the lungs for oxygenation, and then the blood returns uh, oxygenated to the left side of the heart, to the left atria, and then to the left ventricle. And from there, it's going to be sent out through the uh, aortic arch and the aorta to head off to the uh, rest of the body. Now, as I said, uh, you know, it's oxygen poor, CO2 rich on this side. And on this side, if everything's working right, it should be O2 rich and CO2 poor at this point. Now, the concept of an artery and a vein, we haven't talked blood vessels yet, but the definition of a vein is basically a blood vessel that brings blood back towards the heart. And that's what we see here, is this is a blood vessel. Now, it's carrying fairly oxygenated blood back to the heart, so this is actually technically a vein. And this is an artery because even though it's carrying low amounts of O2 compared to what we would expect in an artery, it fits the definition that's taking blood away from the heart. Now let's talk a bit about where the heart is. Uh, it's located in the mediastinum, and that's the area between the lungs. Its base is fairly wide, um, and, and that's the superior part of the heart. Now we tend to think base means bottom, but, but it doesn't. Um, it just means a wide bit. And it's up here that the large vessels attach. The apex is tapered towards the inferior end, and it tilts over to the left. Now, when we looked at lungs, we saw that the left lung accommodates the vast majority of the heart, that much of the heart sort of lays over towards the left lung, and there is that, that sort of indentation that the heart sits in. Now, this is an American book, so they're using ounces, 10 ounces, 3.5 inches wide, 5 inches from uh, base to apex. And to give you an approximation, uh, that, that a heart of a given individual is about the size of their fist, give or take, as long as it's a healthy heart. 
Now here we can see the positioning of the heart and once again we can see that it's it's tilted over and sort of imposes upon the left lung. And and a lot of people sort of fall into this this concept of, you know, first of all the old old vision of the shape of the heart. No, it doesn't look like Valentine's Day heart. But look at it. It it's not standing sort of straight up. It's largely lying on its side on its right side and we can see here these big vessels seem to be associated with the base area and often these collectively are called the great vessels of the heart and we can see some of these and we'll go into them more detail down the road we have the aorta we have the pulmonary trunk uh, we also have um, inferior inferior and superior vena cava that would be bringing blood in. We can also get a good uh, feeling here for the area of the mediastinum, and that's the area between the lungs. And you can also see, and this is something we'll talk about down the road, is that the heart is actually surrounded by a series of membranes, very much like the lungs were. It's a, it's, it's a double membrane. And for many of the same reasons that the lung did, it reduces friction, it gives it some protection, it sort of seals it off from the thoracic cavity. Uh, you know, this also reduces the uh, potential of infection to travel out of or into uh, the organ. And we can also see down here that the heart, there's fibers that actually connect the outer uh, membrane surround the heart to the diaphragm, the large muscle down here. So there really is a, a big association between the diaphragm and the connection to the outer membranes of the heart. Now to give you an, a sense as to where it sits, here we're looking at the sternum and you can see that most of the heart is located behind the sternum. And to give you an idea, uh, here is the area of the manubrium, that's the upper part of the sternum. And you can see there's a line here where the manubrium joins the actual body of the sternum. That little line there, which happens to be not at the first rib, but where the second rib joins, that gives you some pretty good indication that lies behind there. We would find the uh, start of the aortic arch behind there. Now let's talk a bit about the membranes that surround the heart. We have the pericardium, and it's a double-walled sac that encloses the heart. Why? This reduces the friction. Because imagine a heart that's beating on average, you know, maybe 65 to 75 beats per minute. That's a lot of movement, so it helps the heart to beat without friction. And it, it's part of the, the, the membrane is loose, the outer, outer layer. And so it gives room for the heart to expand. Yet, it also is able to resist excessive expansion. So it, it's, it's sort of an outer sort of shopping bag around the heart, the outer membrane. We'll see if there's a couple layers to this. And, you know, it, it gives that room for the heart to expand, contract. But on the other hand, if the heart tries to go too big, it'll, it'll help to sort of go, hey, hey you're not going to expand much because I'm not going to expand to allow you to expand anymore. And as I said, it's also anchored to the diaphragm anteriorly and the sternum anteriorly. Now, when I start to look at this pericardium, we're going to see that there's actually a number of layers. The outer one is the fibrous pericardium, and it's not attached directly to the heart. The inner one is the serous pericardium, and this has two layers. So there's two layers we're looking at. One is a parietal layer, and that parietal layer actually lines the fibrous pericardium. And then as I'm moving towards the surface of the heart, there is a visceral layer. Now, I want to point out this visceral layer has a second name that's used interchangeably, and that is the epicardium, and that covers the surface of the heart. Now, in between the parietal and the visceral layers, there is a space. It's not a huge space, but there's a space, and it's the pericardial cavity. And it does contain a fluid, somewhere between 
five to 30 milliliters of pericardial fluid. And this helps to reduce the friction. Now, sometimes you can get inflammation in these membranes and associated with this space. This can often lead to a very painful condition known as pericarditis. And if you sort of break the word apart, you know, for pericardial membranes, card for heart, you know, cardiovascular, etc. And as soon as I see the ending itis, itis suggests inflammation, so pericarditis. Let's just have a look at these membranes. And you can see that here is the outer fibrous. So it's the fibrous pericardium. And you can see that fibers, the outer fibrous pericardium, help to anchor the heart. And this is the diaphragm down here. All right, so that's the outer fibrous area uh, layer. And as I said, it, it's tough, but it's sort of a little loose, so it gives some room for expansion of the heart. And then what happens is, and let's go up here, let's look up here, is that this outer fibrous pericardium, let's make it a little bit bigger, this outer fibrous pericardium folds back on itself to form an inner layer. Okay. And this is the visceral pericardium also known as the epicardium. Now, when I look at the, uh, when I look at the fibrous pericardium, there's the fibrous pericardium, here is the parietal layer, okay? And then here is the visceral layer. And as I said, the, uh, this one folds back on itself. And we actually have a pericardial cavity here. And this is where I would find the fluid. Okay, let's just have a look um, at the anatomy of a real heart. And of course, it, it's not what you typically think when you think of the heart. Uh, it, look at its shape. Now, this is a heart that doesn't have blood in it, it's not beating, etc. And the one thing that we see is uh, a lot of this stuff, this is a lot of fat. There's a lot of fat on the outside of, of many hearts. And often what this fat's doing is it's hiding little grooves that are underneath here. And in those grooves were some of the major arteries that actually feed the heart itself, the cardiac uh, vessels. So we have an area here, it was the left ventricle. Area over here is the right ventricle. Um, here's an area where the anterior interventricular artery Later on, we're going to see that's an artery that runs along the surface in a groove between the left and the right ventricle. Now, let's have a look inside. Now, this is a posterior view of the heart, and it's being sectioned. And we can start to see a few things. That, first of all, here is the wall that separates the two ventricles. Now, the way that they open this, it, it's almost like they cut the heart and open it like a book. Over here is the right ventricle. Over here is the left ventricle. How do I know that? Well, it says so, but the, there's something even better than that, and this is something that we should get used to look for whenever we're looking at a ventricle, is look at the thickness of the wall. That left ventricle is a very thick wall. The right ventricle is not as thick. And think about it. The right ventricle is pumping blood basically to a place right next door, and those are the lungs. So it's not dealing with a lot of resistance pushing blood through these long, endless, numerous pipes. And the other thing is, remember, the key thing about blood flow to the lungs, it's high volume, but it's low pressure. So it doesn't have to build up a, a huge pressure gradient. So we tend to see that the wall is much thinner. Whereas over here, the left ventricle has to push blood to everywhere else in the body other than the lungs. Now, how do I know this is a ventricle? Well, we're going to look at some more of this anatomy in detail down the road. Uh, I can tell this is a ventricle because all these little strings that are in it. And these are the chordae tendinae. So if I see a chamber and I see these strings, I know I'm in a ventricle. Because up here is part of one of the flaps of the one of the atrioventricular valves. 
the atria are up here, the ventricles are down here, this is one of the flaps of the valves, and attached to the margin of those flaps are these little strings uh, called tendinous cords or chordae tendinae. Either one works. And I only see, now you notice that they come down. Let me get the, go there first. You notice that they come down and they attach onto, it looks like little rises of muscle. This is papillary muscle that it attaches onto. So it's actually attaching onto little sort of finger-like projections of muscle. And these chordae tendinae only exist within a ventricle. Now, just talk a bit about the heart wall. The heart wall, now we're not talking about the membranes. We talked about the membranes before. But the heart wall has epicardium. Remember, we, epicardium is the inner layer of those membranes. Then as I go deep, myocardium, myo for muscle. And then inside, I have endocardium because there is tissue that lines the cavities that make up things like the ventricles. So let's walk through them. The epicardium is a the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. So it's the serous membrane covering the heart. Uh, in some places we'll see adipose in, in sometimes it's thick, especially in the little grooves that blood vessels travel through the sulci that we'll see, the coronary blood vessels travel through this layer. Now let's go to the next layer, the endocardium. So this is right in the very inside. Okay. So the first one we looked at was the outer layer of the, of the surface of the heart. And then this is the layer that lines the cavities so it's the smooth inner lining of the heart and also the blood vessels is continuous with it. It also covers the uh, valve surfaces and is continuous with the endothelium of the blood vessels. And then sandwiched between the epicardium, which is epi means on the surface outside, and the endocardium is the myocardium. And it's a layer, a cardiac muscle. And as I said, you know, in the right ventricle, it's not that thick because it doesn't have to work as hard. In the left ventricle, it's much thicker. So we tend to see it proportional to the workload that's being asked in that part of the heart. And the other thing too is that the muscles are arranged in spirals that provides almost a ringing motion or a vortex uh, type motion. And this is a feature that helps to squeeze some of the, a lot of the blood out of the ventricles. Now, there is another structure that's embedded in the heart wall, and it's called the fibrous skeleton, the fibrous skeleton of the heart. And this is basically collagen and elastic fibers. Now, why are they there? They do a number of things is that they provide structural support and attachment for the cardiac muscles. And also it's a place that the valves anchor themselves. So this gives sort of that real structural support because this heart you know, is beating so many times a minute that, that really needs the, this sort of inbuilt sort of inner structure, the uh, fiber skeleton. It also provides electrical insulation between the atria and the ventricles and important in the timing and coordination of contractile activity. So it has a big role in that too. Okay. Now, just having a look at the heart. Uh, this is a heart where you can see that they've actually cleared off the fat because often we'd see fat uh, over these areas. And we'll come back and talk about, but you can start to get a sense as to some of the, the blood vessels that are designed to feed and uh, nourish the heart themselves, the cardiac blood vessels. And looking at this, the one thing I want to point out is you can actually see that spiral nature of the muscle fibers. And you can see how it sort of surrounds 
the heart goes around the heart in a spiral. And down here at the apex, you really get a sense as to the spiraling nature of these fibers. And of course, one of the big roles is because here in a ventricle, the blood has to exit towards the top of the ventricle. That's where the outlet is. So by having spiral fibers, it's almost having like having a, a tube of toothpaste where, you know, at the very bottom end of the toothpaste tube, if you start to squeeze and push up towards the outlet, it'll move the toothpaste up and out. And so the spiral nature helps to move the blood up and out towards the various exit points. Okay, we're going to uh, leave it there and come back and talk some more anatomy of the heart in the next